The Michael Mystery, Chapter 20 Sleeping and Waking in the Light of the Previous Observations Sleeping and waking has been a theme frequently discussed in our anthroposophical studies and from various points of view. But with the facts of life such as these, the understanding of them requires to be carried to a new depth every time after studying a different aspect of the world. All that has been said about the earth as life seed of a new rising macrocosm makes it possible now to bring a deepened understanding to our views of sleeping and waking. In this waking state, man lives in the thought shadows cast by a dead and dying world, and in will impulses into whose inner being he as little sees in ordinary consciousness as he sees what is going on in deep dreamless sleep. With the inflow of the subconscious will impulses into the thought shadows arises the free, self-directed consciousness of the individual self. In this self-consciousness lives the I. Whilst man is in this state, awake to the life of the world around him, through all the feelings that inwardly arise in him, there run non-earthly, cosmic impulses that reach from a far distant cosmic past into the present. He is not conscious of this. A being can be conscious of that alone, in which it takes part for its own dying forces, not through the forces of growth which feed its life. This man comes to self-realisation through the loss from his mind's eye of that which is the very basis of his own inner being. This, however, is precisely what enables him, whilst in the waking state, to feel himself utterly immersed in the thought shadows. No flicker of life disturbs the inner state of participation in the world of the dead and dying. This life amid the dead and dying conceals, however, the essential characteristic of the earth world, namely that it is the life seed of a new universe. Man in his waking state does not perceive the earth as the earth truly is. Her first beginnings of new cosmic life escape him. So man lives in that which the earth gives him as basis for his self-consciousness. He loses sight in his mind's eye of the true form of his own Im impulses during this age of self-conscious ego development and loses sight too of the true form of his surroundings. But it is just in this hovering above the stable reality of the world that man realises the stable reality of his eye, realises himself as a self-conscious being Above him is the non-earthly extraterrestrial cosmos. Beneath him, in the earth region, is a world whose real being remains concealed between the two the free being of the eye becomes revealed, radiant in the fullness of perceptive knowledge and free will. In sleep it is otherwise. Here man lives in his astral body and eye amid the young seed life of earth. The most intense will to life is all about man during his dreamless sleep. Through his dreams also runs this stir of life, though not so strongly but that the man can be aware of them in a sort of half-consciousness. And in this half-conscious dream panorama are seen the forces by whose means the human being is woven out of the cosmos. In the passing flash of the dream can be seen the astral power as it flows into the ether body and quickens the man to life. In the surging life and light of dreams, thought is living still. Only after awakening is thought hemmed in by those forces which bring about its death, reduce it to a shadow. This connection between the dream picture and the waking thought is of great significance. Man thinks of the same forces as those which enable him to grow and to live. Only for man to become a thinker these thoughts must be ever dying. Here is the point where true understanding may dawn upon the mind of why it is that man in his thinking grasps reality. He has in this thoughts the dead likeness of that by which he himself is formed and created out of a living, life-giving reality. The dead likeness. But this dead likeness is the life work of the greatest of all painters, the cosmos itself. From the likeness the life indeed is gone. Were the life not gone, man's eye could not evolve. Nevertheless, this likeness contains the whole content of the universe in all its glory. 
So far as was possible at the time, within the general lines of the book, I pointed out this inner relation between thinking and world reality long ago in my philosophy of freedom. It is indicated in the place where I speak of a bridge leading from the depths of the thinking eye to the depths of nature's reality. The reason why sleep acts upon the ordinary consciousness as an extinguisher is because it leads into the teeming life of Earth, shooting and sprouting up into the new, growing macrocosmos. When the imaginative consciousness puts an end to this extinguishing action of sleep, the Earth, which then presents itself to the human soul, is not one of sharp outlines in mineral, vegetable and animal kingdoms. It is rather a living process that the soul has then before her, a living process kindled in the Earth and flaming out into the macrocosm. This man has to rise himself with the reality of his own I am out of the world's reality in his waking state in order to arrive at a free and independent self-consciousness. In his sleeping state he unites himself once more with world reality. Such at the present cosmic moment is the rhythm of man's earthly life outside the inner being of the world but with the conscious experience of his own being and within the inner being of the world whilst the consciousness of his own being is extinguished. In the state between death and a new birth, the eye of man is living within the beings of the spirit world. There everything comes to consciousness that escaped consciousness during the waking life of earth. There the macrocosmic forces pass across the scene from all their fullness of life in the far distant past down to their dead and dying existence in the present. But the earthly forces too display themselves which are the vices of the growing macrocosm that is to be. A man looks there into his sleeping states as during earth life he looks at the earth shining in the sunlight. Only because the macrocosm, such as it is, is in the present, has become a thing of the dead, is it possible for the human being between death and new birth to lead a life which, compared to the waking life on earth, signifies a higher awakening, an awakening which enables man completely to master the forces of which but a transitory flicker is seen in dreams. These are forces filling the whole cosmos. They permeate everything. From them the human being draws the impulses with which, on his descent to earth, he fashions his own body, the masterpiece of the macrocosmic artist. What in dreams is but a brief, sun-abandoned glimmer, lives in the spirit world transfused with spiritual sunlight, waiting until the beings of the higher hierarchy, or man himself, shall call it forth in creative work for the moulding of new life and being. Leading Thoughts In the waking state, in order to gain living knowledge of himself in full and free self-consciousness, man is obliged to forego the living knowledge of reality in its true form both in his own existence and in nature's. He lifts himself out of his sea of reality so that in his thought shadows he may make his own eye his own real experience. In the sleeping state, man lives with the life of the earth around him, but this life extinguishes his consciousness of self. In dreams there flickers up in half-consciousness that forceful world reality of which man's being is woven and from what he fashions his body when he comes down out of the spirit world. In earth life, this forceful world reality is reduced to death in shadow thoughts, since only thus can it give the basis for self-conscious man. The Michael Mystery Chapter 21 Gnosis and Anthroposophy At the time when the mystery of Golgotha was consummated, Gnosis was the form which thought took amongst that portion of mankind who at the time were able to understand with knowledge and not merely with dim feeling this, the greatest impulse in man's earthly evolution. To understand what was the peculiar disposition of soul in which the Gnosis lived within men, we must keep in sight that the age of this Gnosis was the age when the intellectual or mind soul was being developed. In this fact, we may also find the reason why the Gnosis vanished almost entirely out of human history. That it should thus have vanished is perhaps 
until the cause be understood, one of the most amazing occurrences in the whole progress of mankind. The development of the intellectual or mind soul was preceded by that of the sentient soul, and this again by the development of the sentient body. So long as the facts of the world are being perceived through the sentient body, all man's knowledge lives in his senses. The world is seen, coloured, heard, sounding, and so on. But in the colours, in the sounds, in the varying states of warmth, a material substance, presenting certain appearances of colour, warmth and so on, there is no question. Men talk of spiritual beings who reveal themselves through what the senses perceive. In this age, there is as yet no special exercise of an understanding that exists in man alongside of and distinct from sense perception. Man either yields himself up with his whole human being to the outer world and then the gods reveal themselves to him through his senses, or else he draws back from the outer world within his own soul life, and then feels in his inner man the dull, indistinct sense of life. A notable change sets in when the sentient soul begins to develop. The revelation of the divine world through the senses begins to fade. In its place begins an outward perception of sense impressions so to speak, God divested, of colours, states of warmth, and so on. Meanwhile, within, the divine world reveals itself in spiritual form, in picture ideas of the mind. Man now perceives the world from two aspects, from without through the impressions of sense, and from within through the spiritual impressions of the mind in the form of ideas. Man must next learn to have as distinct, as clearly formed a perception of these inner spiritual impressions as he had before of the God-informed impressions of the senses. So long as the reign of the sentient soul age lasts, he can do this, for out of his own inner being the idea pictures rise up in full and vivid form. His mind is filled from within by a sense-free spirit content, which is a copy of the world content, if formerly the gods revealed themselves to him robed in sense vestments, they now reveal themselves in spirit vestments. This was essentially the time when the Gnosis came into being and when it flourished. A wonderful living law is there in which man knows himself a partaker when he unfolds his inner being in purity so that the divine content may be revealed within it. From the fourth down to the first millennium before the coming of the mystery of Golgotha, this gnosis was prevalent throughout the portion of mankind who advanced furthest in the way of knowledge. Then begins the age of the intellectual or mind-soul. Now the world images of God no longer rise up of themselves out of the inner man. Man himself must exert inward power in order to evoke them from his soul. The outer world with its sense impressions becomes a question. Man, when he exerts the inward power and evokes the divine world images, obtains answers. But the images are power in comparison with their earlier form. It is this phase of the human soul which comes to such marvellous expression in ancient Greece. The Greek felt himself in the midst of the outer world which strikes the senses and he felt in the outer world the magic which could arouse his own inner power to the unfolding of world pictures. On philosophic ground, this phase of the human soul found its development in Platonism. But in the background behind all this was the world of the mysteries. Here was faithfully treasured and preserved all that had come over as gnosis from the age of the sentient soul. Human souls were trained to be its faithful treasurers. The intellectual or mind-soul developed in the ordinary cause of evolution. The sentient soul was quickened by special training, and so, behind the ordinary religious and social life of the day, there flourished, more particularly in this age of the intellectual or mind-soul, a mystery life of a very richly developed form. Here the divine world images continue to have life, inasmuch as they were made for spiritual content of cult and ritual. 
Look into the inner side of these mysteries, and one sees the world pictured in the most wonderful ceremonies and rituals. The human beings in whose inner life this had been awakened were those who were able to penetrate the mystery of Golgotha, at the time when it was consummated, in its profound cosmic significance. But it was a mystery life which kept quite aloof from the external world and its affairs in order to cultivate the spirit picture world in purity, and it became ever harder for men's souls to call forth the pictures. Then, in the highest places of the mystery, spirit beings descended out of the spiritual cosmos to aid struggling men in their efforts after knowledge. So the impulses of the sentient age were continued and further developed under the influence of the gods themselves. There arose a gnosis of the mystery, of which none but a very few had even the faintest conception. Alongside this mystery gnosis was what men could take in with the intellectual or mind-soul. This was the exoteric gnosis, of which fragments have come down to posterity. In the exoteric gnosis of the mysteries, men became ever more incapable of rising to the development of the sentient soul, and so this esoteric wisdom passed over more and more into the care and cultivation of the gods alone. This is one of the deep secrets in the historic evolution of mankind. Divine mysteries, so to speak, were at work in it from the first centuries of Christianity down into the Middle Ages. In these divine mysteries, the treasure which men could no longer preserve was preserved in earthly life by angelic beings, and so the gnosis of the mysteries lived on whilst the exoteric gnosis was being diligently exterminated. The world image content, treasured in a spiritual way by spiritual beings, preserved in the gnosis of the mysteries, so long as it was needed for the advancement of mankind, could not indeed be made accessible to the conscious understanding of men's souls. But the feeling content could be preserved, so that at the right cosmic moment, when men were fitly prepared, it might be given to them and bring them the warmth of soul with which the spiritual soul might, later on and in a new way, penetrate into the kingdom of the spirit. The spirit beings built the bridge between the old world content and the new, There are indications to be found in this mystery of human evolution. The holy vessel of the Grau, cap of Jasper, used by Christ when he broke the bread, in which Joseph of Arimathea caught the blood which flowed from the pierced side of Jesus, the cup that is, which held the mystery of Golgotha, was taken, so legend says, into the custody of angels, until the castle of the Grau had been built by Titor, and it could descend upon those human beings who were duly prepared to receive it. Spirit beings treasured the world images in which lived the mystery of Golgotha, and when the time was come they sent down, not indeed the imaginative content, that was not possible, but the feeling content into the minds of men. It can be but a stimulus, this feeling legacy of an ancient knowledge implanted in the hearts of men, yet it is a very powerful stimulus from which in our age, out of the spiritual soul, there may grow up, by the light of Michael's agency, a new and full understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. Anthroposophy is striving after this new understanding. From the description given, it is clear that anthroposophy cannot be a revival of the gnosis, for this was the mode of knowledge of the sentient soul, whereas anthroposophy has to draw a no less rich content of knowledge out of the spiritual soul, and in a totally new way. Leading Thought The Gnosis developed in its characteristic form in the age of the sentient soul, fourth to first millennium before the incident of the mystery of Golgotha. The Divine reveals itself in this age of man inwardly as a spiritual content of the mind, whereas in the previous period, the age of the sentient body, it had revealed itself in and with the sense impressions of the outer world. In the age of the intellectual or mind soul, the divine, a spiritual content, has faded from the inner life and can be realised but faintly. 
the Gnosis is preserved in sternly guarded mysteries, and when men can preserve it no longer, because they are no longer able to re-quicken the sentient soul, spirit beings take charge of it and carry over into the Middle Ages, not indeed the knowledge content, but the feeling content of it. This is indicated in the legend of the Holy Grail. Meanwhile, the exoteric Gnosis, which found its way into the intellectual or mind soul, is being forcibly exterminated. Anthroposophy cannot be a revival of the Gnosis, for Gnosis was connected with the development of the sentient soul. The work of Anthroposophy is, by the light of Michael's agency, to evolve out of the spiritual soul a new form of understanding of Christ and the world. Gnosis was the old form of knowledge, preserved from earlier times, the one best able, at the time when the mystery of Golgotha took place, to convey this mystery to men's understanding. The Michael Mystery, Chapter 22 Men's Freedom and the Michael Age In the human faculty of remembrance, there lives the reproduction in personal form of a cosmic power which once worked at the formation of man's being, as was described in the last few letters. The same cosmic power continues, however, to be active at the present time. It works as the force of growth, as life-giving impulse behind the scenes of human life. Here expends the greater part of its force. Only one little part is separated off become a function of the spiritual soul. There it works as the power of memory or remembrance. One must look at this power of remembrance in the proper light, when man today, in the present age of cosmic evolution, perceives through his senses, this perceiving is a momentary lighting up in consciousness of world images. The lighting up comes when the sense is directed upon the outer world. It illumines the field of consciousness and disappears when the sense ceases to be turned upon the outer world. But what here lights up in the human soul can have no duration. For unless man can dismiss it promptly from his consciousness, he will become merged in this content of his consciousness and lose himself. He would no longer be himself. Only for a brief time, in the so-called after-images, which so much interested Goethe, May this lighting up from a sense perception have life in the consciousness. Neither must this content of consciousness become set or harden into real existence. It must remain image. It must no more become real than the image in the looking grass can become real. With anything that ended by making itself a reality in his consciousness, man would no less lose himself than with something that of itself was permanent. Here again he could no more be himself. Sense perception of the outer world is, then, an inward painting of the human soul. A painting without paint. A painting is spirit waxing and spirit waning. As in nature the rainbow comes and goes again and leaves no trace behind, so too all sense perception comes and passes away without itself, of its own nature, leaving any memory behind. But with every perception there is at the same time another process transacted between the human soul and the world outside. It is a process that goes on in the background, in remoter parts of the soul's life. There where the forces of growth, the life impulses are at work. And in this part of the soul's life, not a transitory image merely, but a real and lasting reproduction is imprinted with each act of perception. This man can bear, for it is a real-world content, playing in part in man's existence. It can take place without his losing himself, any more than he loses himself when without his own full consciousness he grows or is nourished by his food. When man now calls up his memories from the inner depths, it is an internal perception of what was permanently left by this second process that accompanies the external perception. Again the soul paints, but now she paints the past that is living in her own human inner being. And again with this painting, no lasting reality must be formed within the consciousness, but only an image that comes and goes. 
Such is the connection in the human soul between the forming of mental conceptions, mental images, in the moment of perception and remembrance. For these forces of remembrance are remnants of the past in man's evolution, and as such they fall under the dominion of Lucifer. It is Lucifer's endeavour to give substance in man to the impressions of the outer world and to condense them so that they may continue to shine on as lasting mental conceptions in his conscious life. This endeavour of Lucifer's would be crowned with success were it not released by the Michael forces. These will not let what is painted in the mind's inner light harden into real existence, but keep it coming and going as a fleeting picture. The excess of power which thus strings up, but through Lucifer, out of the inner man, will be changed in the Michael age into imagining power. For little by little, the power of spiritual imagination will make its way into the general intellectual consciousness of mankind. That present instance consciousness, however, which man now possesses, will not be thereby burdened with any weight of lasting reality. It will continue to live in pictures that come and go. But with his imaginations, man rears himself aloft into a higher spiritual world. Even as with his remembrances, he reaches inward into this own human being. Man does not retain the imaginations within himself. They are engraved in permanent cosmic existence, and thence he can reproduce them ever afresh in the passing pictures of his mental life. That which is saved by Michael from becoming fixed and hardened in the inner life of man is in this way received by the spiritual world. All that man realises of the power of conscious imagining is converted at the same time into world content. That this is possible is a result of the mystery of Golgotha. The Christ power imprints man's imagination upon the cosmos, the Christ power which is united to the earth. So long as this power is not united to the earth, but work from without upon the earth as a sun power, all impulses of growth and life went into the inner man. Man was built up and maintained by them out of the cosmos. Since the Christ impulse has entered into the life of earth, man is given back once more to the cosmos in his self-conscious being. Man, from being a well-being, has become an earth-being. It lies in him to become a well-being once more after having as earth-being become himself. In this fact, namely that man, in his momentary acts of mental conception, in the forming of mental images, is living not in real existence, but only in a reflection of real existence. In a picture existence lies the possibility of evolving freedom. All real existence in the consciousness has compelling power. Only pictures cannot compel. Anything that may take place through the impression made by a mere picture will be quite independent of the picture itself. Man becomes free when, with his spiritual soul, he lifts himself out of the realm of real existence and emerges in a non-existent picture realm. The momentous question then arises, does not man lose real existence when one part of his being he lets go of and holds himself into a realm of non-existence? Here again is a point where we are faced by one of the great problems in the contemplation of the world. What is experienced in consciousness, in the act of mental conception, in the forming of mental images, originated in the cosmos? As regards the cosmos, man plunges into non-existence. He frees himself in the act of mental conception from all forces of the cosmos. He paints the cosmos, being himself outside of it. If this were all, then, for one cosmic instant, a flash of freedom would light up in the human being, but at the same instant human being itself would be dissolved. Whilst, however, in his mental conception, man finds freedom from the cosmos, he is nevertheless in his non-conscious soul life, grafted into the whole of his previous earth lives, and lives between death and new birth. As conscious man, he is in picture existence, while he maintains himself in spiritual reality with his unconscious part. Whilst in the eye of the present moment he awakens to freedom, 
His eye of the past holds him firm in real existence. In respect of real existence, man, when forming a mental conception, is wholly reliant upon what he has become in the course of his cosmic and earthly path. In human evolution, the path here points to that abyss of nothing over which man leaps in the moment of becoming a free being. Michael's action and the Christ impulse make the leap possible. Leading Thoughts In mental conception, man is living with his spiritual soul not in real existence, but in picture existence, in non-existence. Thereby he is freed from experiencing a common life with the cosmos. Pictures do not compel, only real existence compels. And if man nevertheless suits his actions to the pictures, it is done quite independently of the pictures, that is to say, in freedom from the world. At the instance of any such act of mental conception, the only thing that links man to the real existence of the world is what he himself has grown to be from the past, through his previous earth lives, and lives between death and new birth. This is a leap, as regards the cosmos, over non-existence, a leap which man is only enabled to achieve through the action of Michael and through the Christ impulse. The Michael Mystery Chapter 23 where is man as a thinking and remembering being? In mental conception, thinking, and in the awakening of remembrances, man is in the sphere of the physical world. Yet wheresoever he may look in this physical world, nowhere with his senses will he find anything that would give him the powers of mental conception and of remembrance. In the act of mental conception, the consciousness of self arises, self-consciousness, as indicated in the preceding letters, is a possession that man has acquired by the powers of the earth world, but these are earthly powers of a kind that remain hid from the observation of the senses. What man thinks in earthly life is, it is true, only what comes to him by means of his senses, but the power to think it does not come to him from any of the things that he does think. Where then is to be found this power which, out of the realm of earth, forms mental conception and the images of memory. One finds it if the spirit's eye be directed towards that which man brings with him from his previous earth lives. Ordinary consciousness knows nothing of this. It lives of itself, unconscious in man. But it shows itself at once when man sets foot on earth after the spiritual state of existence to be related to those earthly forces which do not come within the sphere of sense observation and sense thinking. It is not with his mental conceiving, this thinking, that man is in this sphere, but with his willing, which works itself out along the lines of his destiny. In view of the fact that the earth contains forces which lie outside the sphere of the senses, we may speak of the spiritual earth as opposite pole to the physical earth. The conclusion then is, that man as a willing being lives in and with the spiritual earth, but that as a mentally conceiving or thinking being, although he is in the midst of the physical earth, he does not live with it. Man as a thinking being carries over forces from the spiritual world into the physical, but with these forces he remains a spirit being that only appears in the physical world but enters into no community with it. The only community entered into by mentally conceiving, thinking, man, in the course of his earthly existence, is with the spiritual earth. And it is in this community with the spiritual earth from which his individual self-consciousness grows. The origin of self-consciousness is due to spiritual processes which man undergoes in earthly life. Comprehending in spiritual vision all that is here described, we have before us the human eye, spiritually seen. With the experiences of memory, we come into the region of the human astral body. In remembering, it is not merely as in the act of mental conception or thinking, the results of previous earth lives that send their stream into the eye of the present moment. It is the active forces of the spirit world to which man was subjected between death and new birth, 
which now stream into his inner life. These forces stream into the astral body. Here again, there is in the physical earth no direct field for the reception of this stream of forces. Man, as a remembering being, can as literally unite himself in remembrance of the things and processes perceived by his senses, as he can unite himself with them as a thinking being in the act of forming mental conceptions. He enters, however, as a remembering being, into community with something which, though not physical, translates the physical into processes, into proceedings, namely with the rhythmic processes in nature and in human life. In nature there is a rhythmic alternation of day and night, a rhythmic succession of seasons, and so on. In man, the breathing and the circulation of the blood proceed rhythmically, so too the alternation of sleep and waking, and so on. Rhythmic processes are nothing physical, whether in nature or in man. They might be called semi-spiritual. The physical as a thing disappears in the rhythmic process. In his remembering, man with his inner being is translated into the rhythm which is both his and nature's. He is then living in his astral body. The aim of the Indian yoga is to enter completely into the life of rhythm. It is an endeavour to get away from the field of mental conception of man's eye. And in a process of living inner experience, similar to the process of remembrance, to see into the world which lies behind what can be known to the ordinary consciousness. The spiritual life of the West must not pursue knowledge by suppressing the eye, rather it must educate the eye to the perception of the spiritual. This cannot be done if one pursues away from the sensible into the rhythmic world, where all that one realises in the rhythm is the passing over of the physical into a semi-spiritual. The better alternative is to seek that sphere of the spirit world which manifests itself in the rhythm. Two ways are therefore possible. First, the experiencing of the physical in the rhythmic realm where the physical passes into the semi-spiritual. This is an older road, no longer to be taken today. Secondly, the experiencing of that spiritual world of which the world rhythm, both in and outside of man, is the special sphere even as the special sphere of man is the earth world, with its physical being and physical events. Now this is the spirit world to which belongs all that is being done, in the present cosmic moment, by Michael, a spirit such as Michael, by taking up his habitation in the rhythmic world, brings what otherwise would live in Lucifer's domain into the field of purely human evolution, of which Lucifer has no influence. This all becomes plainly visible when man enters into imagination. For the soul, in her imaginings, lives in rhythm, and Michael's world is the world that manifests itself in rhythm. With remembrance, memory, we are already in this same world, but not very deep. The ordinary consciousness knows nothing of its life. But when we enter imagination, then, out of the rhythmic world there rises up, first the world of subjective memories, this, however, passes over at once into the world of ideal form, whose life is in the ether. The archetypes created by the divine spiritual world for the physical, we experience the ether, lighting up in cosmic pictures, bearing within it the creative process of the world, and the forces of the sun weaving in this ether. Here they not only radiate, out of the light they conjure forth the cosmic archetype. The sun is now revealed as the world painter, the cosmic artist. The sun is the cosmic counterpart of those impulses which in man paint the pictures of mental conception of thought. Leading thoughts. Man as a thinking being lives within the spheres of the physical earth, but he enters into no community with this physical earth. His life is that of a being of mind and spirit, open to the impressions of the physical world. For the forces for his thought come to him from the spiritual earth, by the same route as that which leads him, as the result of previous earth lives, to the realisation of his destiny in life. What lies in the life of remembrance, 
of memory is already in that world wherein rhythm and physical becomes half spiritual and where such spiritual events take place as are being enacted at the present cosmic moment by Michael. For anyone who has learnt rightly to know thinking and remembrance, it becomes understandable how man as an earth being lives within the sphere of earth, yet never becomes wholly immersed in this earth sphere. As a being from beyond the earth, man is seeking, through community with the spiritual earth, to attain his own self-consciousness, and therefore the fulfilment of his I. The Michael Mystery Chapter 24 Man in his Macrocosmic Being The cosmos reveals itself to man in the first instance from two sides, the earth and outside the earth the universe of stars. To earth and her forces man feels himself related. Life teaches him this relationship with great distinctness. Not in the same way does he feel himself in the present age, related to the star world about him. This, however, only lasts so long as he remains unconscious of his ether body. To lay hold of the ether body in imaginations is to acquire the same feeling of kinship with the starry universe as one has with the consciousness of the physical body with the earth. It exists by drawing on the preserved store of old astral forces and must disappear on the preserved store of old astral forces, and must disappear when these are exhausted. In man, on the contrary, new astral forces come in that are drawn from the sun power. These make it possible for him to carry on his evolution into the future. It is not possible, as all this shows, to understand man in his own special form of being, unless one recognises his connection with the whole star life as clearly as his connection with the earth. Even what man receives from the earth for the development of his self-consciousness proceeds from the action of the spirit world within the earthly sphere. That the sun power can give man what he needs for his astral life is the result of influences that were active during the old sun age. It was then that the earth received the capacity to develop the eye impulses of mankind. It is the spiritual part which the earth has preserved within her from the old sun life, and which is kept from dying out by the sun influences of the present day. The earth herself was once sun, then she passed over into a spiritual form. In the present cosmic age, what is sun works from without. This sun influence from without is a spring of ever-renewing youth to those spirit forces from an earlier age which are wearing old. At the same time, as an active force of the present, this sun influence keeps what is of the past from falling into Lucifer's domain. For whatever continues to work on as an influence from the past, without being taken up into the forces of the present, falls a prey to Lucifer. Man's feeling of his own intimate connection with the extraterrestrial cosmos may be said, in this cosmic age, be so dulled that he is not aware of it in his consciousness. It is not only dulled, it is deafened by the feeling of his intimate connection with the sphere of earth. Because man's consciousness of his individual self must be learnt in the sphere of earth. He begins the age of the spiritual soul by growing so closely involved with this earthly sphere that it exerts a much stronger influence over him than is compatible with the course which his soul life should rightly take. Man is, as it were, deafened, dazed by the impressions of the sense world. Overpowered by their clamour, he fails to call up the free, active thinking that has life in it itself. The whole time, from the middle of the 19th century on, was a period of being dazed and deafened by the loudness of the sense impressions. It has been the great illusion of this period that in it people took this overpowerful life of the senses to be the right one, a life of sense which was doing its best to blot out all life in the non-earthly extraterrestrial cosmos. Into this day's condition the Aramanic powers could come in and work their will. Lucifer was more held in check by the sun forces than Araman. Araman was in a position to arouse 
notably amongst the men of science. The dangerous notions that ideas are only applicable to the impressions of the senses. Accordingly, it is just in these circles that anthroposophy meets with but little understanding. Faced with the results of spiritual science, they try to understand them with their ideas. But these ideas cannot comprehend the spiritual, because their inherent living knowledge is deafened and overpowered by the aramanized science of the senses. And so people take alarm and think they would be committing themselves to a blind belief in authority if they were to enter seriously upon the results obtained by the spiritual seer. Darker and darker grew the extraterrestrial cosmos for human consciousness in the second half of the 19th century. When man again grows able to realise the life of ideas within him, even when not supporting himself and them upon the world of sense, then to the eyes of the inquirer an answering light will stream again from the cosmos beyond the realm of earth. And this is to make acquaintance with Michael and his kingdom. When a time comes, when the festival of Michael in the autumn fall will be kept in truth and inwardness, then, in the feelings of those that keep the festival, there will arise with innermost sincerity, as leaped motif, the strain and live in men's consciousness. In the fullness of ideas, the soul experiences spirit light, even when the outward show of the senses linger, but as memory in the mind of man. When, with some such tone of mind as this, man can celebrate the Michael festival, after it he will be able to worthily enter again into the world of the senses, and Araman will be unable to harm him. Leading Thoughts With the beginning of the age of consciousness, dullness came over man's feeling of his connection with the extraterrestrial cosmos. On the other hand, his feeling of connection with the earth through his life in sense impressions grew so strong, more especially with the men of science, as to amount to a dazed and benumbed condition. In this condition, the working of the aromanic powers is peculiarly dangerous, for man lives under the illusion that this overpowering life in sense impressions is the right thing and a real step forward in evolution. Man must find the power to shed light through his world of ideas and to live in these ideas as in a world of light, even when unsupported by the clamorous world of the senses. In this living in a realisation of the self-dependent and in their self-dependent, luminous world of ideas will awake the feeling of man's connection with the non-earthly outer cosmos. A foundation will thus be laid for festivals of Michael. The Michael Mystery, Chapter 25 Man's Sensing and Thinking Systems in Their Relation to the World When man, in the study of his own human being, begins by applying the imaginative mode of knowledge to himself, he strips off in contemplation his sense system. He becomes for his own self-contemplation a being without a sense system. He does not cease to have before his soul pictures such as were previously conveyed by the organs of sense, but he ceases to feel himself connected with the physical outer world by means of these organs. The pictures which he has before his soul of the physical world outside are not now conveyed by the sense organs. They are a direct proof of the fact that, through and beyond the sensory connection, man has all the time another connection with the natural world around him, one that is not conveyed by the outer senses. It is connection with the spirit which finds embodiment in the outer world of nature. In contemplation of this kind, the physical world drops away from man. It is the earthly element that is falling off. Man feels this earthly element no more invest in him. It might be supposed that therewith his consciousness or self would vanish. This would appear to follow from what was said in our previous studies where the consciousness of self was described as being a result of man's connection with the earth being. This is not, however, the case. What man has acquired through the earthly element still remains his, even when after acquiring it, 
he strips the earthly wrappings off him in the living experience of knowledge. Seen as described with spiritual imaginative vision, it is plain that man's sense system is not, after all, so very closely bound up with him. Is it not really he who is living in this sense system, but the world around him? The world has built itself with its own form of being into the sensory organism of man. To the man, therefore, who views it with imaginative vision, this sensory organism, too, is a piece of outer world. It is a piece of outer world which certainly lies more close to him than the natural world around, but which is, nevertheless, outer world. It is distinguished from the rest of the outer world only by this, that into the latter man can only enter with cognition through the medium of sense perception whereas into his sense organism he enters livingly in immediate acquaintance. The sense organism is outer world, but into all the recesses of this outer world man stretches out his own being of soul and spirit, which he brings with him from the spirit world on entering earthly life. Except for the fact that man enters his sense organism and fills it with his own soul and spirit, this organism is as much outer world as is the plant world spread out round about him. The eye belongs, when all is said and done, to the world, not to man, just as the rose which man perceives belongs not to him, but to the world. In the age through which man has just passed in cosmic evolution, scientifically minded persons begin to maintain the view that colour, sound, heat impressions are not really in the world, but in man. The supposed red colour is not, they see, a thing outside, in the real world environment of man, but merely the effect produced in the man himself by an unknown something. The truth, however, is the direct opposite of this. It is not that the colour together with the eye is part of the human being, but that the eye together with the colour is part of the world. Man is not passively taken into himself all through his life on earth, a current of impressions from his earthly surroundings, but rather he himself has grown out from birth to death into this world outside him. It is significant that at the end of the Dark Age, when man stares out into the world without inwardly realising so much as a dawning glimmer of the spirit's light, the true picture of man's relation to this world about him should be converted into the direct opposite of the truth. When, in imaginative knowledge, man has divested himself of that first environing world in which he lives with his sense organism, he becomes inwardly aware of another organism, by which the thinking process is supported, even as the perception of sensory images is supported by the sense organism. And now he is aware that as man he is connected by this thinking organism with his cosmic environment of stars, even as he was hitherto aware of being connected through the sense organism with his earthly environment. He recognises himself as a cosmic being. No more are his thoughts mere shadow pictures. They are saturated with reality, like the sense pictures of sensible perception. And if the disciple of knowledge rises higher, namely to inspiration, he becomes aware that he can again strip off this world on which the thinking organism rests, just as before he stripped off the earthly one. He clearly perceives that with his thinking organism too, he belongs not to his own being, but to the world. He perceives how world thoughts are working through his own thinking system within him. Once more he becomes aware that in his thinking he is not taking into himself mere images of the world, but growing out with his own thinking organism into the world thinking. Both in respect of his sense organism and of his thinking system, Man is world. The world builds itself into him. Hence, in his sense perception and in his thinking, he is not he himself. Here he is world informed. And into this thinking organism, man stretches forth that part now of his being of soul and spirit, which belongs neither to the earth world nor yet to the star world, but which is of a purely spiritual kind, and lives on from earth life to earth life within man. This form of the soul and spirit is only accessible to inspiration. So man goes out of his earthly and cosmic organism 
and stands before himself through his inspiration as a being of pure soul and spirit. In this he is purely spiritual being. Man meets with the ordering of his destiny or fate. With his sense organism man lives in his physical body, with his thinking organism in his ether body. After both these organisms have been laid aside in the living experience of knowledge, he is in his astral body. Every time that man lays aside part of his acquired being, his soul becomes, it is true, poorer in content on one side, but at the same time he becomes richer on the other. If, with the laying aside of the physical body, the beauty of the plant world, as it shone upon the senses, now becomes faint and colourless, man has before his soul, in place of it, the whole world of elemental beings who live in the plant kingdom. Because this is so, a man whose knowledge is really spiritual will not be given to any tone of asceticism towards what the senses can show him. Through all the inner experience of spiritual life, he still feels fully alive in him the need to behold over again, through the senses, what has been experienced in the life of the spirit. In the whole man, striving after living knowledge of complete reality, the perceptions of the senses awaken a longing for their counterpart, the world of the elemental beings. So too the contemplation of the elemental beings awakens a longing for what the sense perceptions have to give. In the totality of human life, spirit cries for sense and sense for spirit. Spiritual existence would be a void did it not bear in it the mindfulness of what was experienced in the life of sense perception. Sense perception would be darkness. Were they not at work in it, below consciousness at first, yet ever shedding light, the power of the spirit? Therefore, when man shall have made himself ripe to realise, along with his realisation of nature's life, the action therein of Michael, there will be no impoverishment in all that the life of nature gives to men's souls, but on the contrary a greater wealth. Nor will the feeling life be in any way inclined to withdraw from the life of the senses, rather will there be a joyful readiness to welcome into the soul all the wonders of the sense world. Leading Faults the human sense organism does not belong to the being of man, but is built into it during earth life from the world without. The seeing eye is spatially in man, essentially it is in the world, and man stretches forth his own essence, his own being of soul and spirit, into what the world is realising in him through his senses. Man, during earth life, does not take in the physical surroundings into himself, he grows out with his being of soul and spirit into these surroundings. It is similar with the thinking organism. Man grows out through his thinking organism into the life of the stars. He recognises himself as star world. Man is living and weaving in the world thoughts when in the living realisation of knowledge he has laid aside his sense organism. After both have been laid aside, both earth world and star world, Man stands before himself as a being of soul spirit. He is no longer world. Here he is the truest sense man. To awaken to what he here experiences is self-knowledge. Even as it is world knowledge to awaken to perception in the sense and thought organism. The Michael Mystery, Chapter 26 Memory and Conscience in his sleeping state, man is given over to the cosmos. He carried over to the cosmos in sleep that which is his, as the fruit of previous earth lives, when he comes down out of the world of soul and spirit into the earthly world. He withdraws this inner core of his human being from the cosmos whilst awake. In this rhythm of being given over to the cosmos, and in turn withdrawn from the cosmos, Life rolls on between birth and death. The withdrawal from the cosmos is at the same time an absorption of the man of soul and spirit by the nerves and senses organism to the physical and life processes which go on in this organism. The spirit and soul part of man is united during waking life. It combines with them in a homogeneous system of working. 
In this working system are included sense perception, the formation of memory pictures and the life of fancy. These functions are attached to the physical body. Mental conceptions, the life of thought, in which man becomes conscious of what goes on half unconsciously in sense perception, fancy and memory. These are attached to the thinking organism. This thinking organism is also, more peculiarly, the region in which man comes to the consciousness of himself. The thinking system is a star system. Were it to lead its life purely as a star system from first to last, Man would bear within him not a self-consciousness, but a God-consciousness. But the thinking system is a star system taken out of the starry cosmos and transplanted into the earthly course of events. In realising the star world in the life of Earth, man becomes a self-conscious being. Here then we find that region of inner human life where the divine spiritual world to which man belongs sets him free in order that he may become man in the fullest sense. But just below the thinking organism, in the region where sense perception, fancy, memory and painting are going on, there the divine spirit world is living in and with the life of man. The divine spirit world may be said to live in man's waking state in the evolution of memory. For the two other functions, sense perception and fancy, are only modifications of this forming of inner memory pictures. In sense perception we have the formation of the mind's memory contents in the nascent state. In fancy contents we have, lighting up in the soul, what lives on of these memory contents in the soul's inner life. The sleeping state carries man's soul and spirit over into the cosmic existence. Here, with all the functions of his astral body and I, he is immersed in the divine spiritual cosmos. He is not only outside the physical, he is also outside the world of stars, but he is within those divine spirit beings from whom his own existence draws its source. At the present moment of cosmic evolution, the manner in which these divine spirit beings work is to imprint the moral world content upon the astral body and the eye during the sleeping state. All world procedures in the sleeping man is real moral procedure, nothing that can be said in the least to resemble the results of an action in external nature. This moral world procedure, in its after effects, is carried by man from his sleeping over into his waking state. The after workings remain in a state of sleep. For man wakes only in that life which is turned towards the field of thought. What is really going on with his willing sphere remains even in waking life, bowed in the same dull darkness as is the whole of his soul life during sleep. But in this sleeping life of will, the divine spirit world continues to weave on in his waking state. Man is morally as good or as bad as he can be, according to how near he can come to the divine spiritual beings in his sleep and he comes nearer to or remains further from them, according as his previous earth life has been in a moral direction. From the depths of the soul's waking being rises the echo of what the soul has been able to receive, implanted into her during sleep in communion with the divine spiritual world. This voice, ringing up from the depths, is the voice of conscience. Thus the very thing for which a materialist view of the world is most prone to find an explanation solely on the natural side shows itself for spiritual knowledge to lie on the moral side. In memory, divine spiritual beings works in the waking man directly. In conscious, the same divine spiritual being works in the waking man indirectly as an after effect. Memory is formed in the nerves and senses organism. Conscious is formed. There was a process purely of the soul and spirit within the metabolic and limb organism. Between the two lies the rhythmic organism. Conscience is formed. There was a process purely of the soul and spirit within the metabolic and limb organism. 
This is developed in two directions, so that each side is polar in relation to the other. As breathing rhythm, it is intimately associated with sense perception and with thinking. In lung breathing, the process is at its coarsest. It becomes more delicate and as refined and sublimated, breathing becomes sense perceiving and thinking. Still quite close to breathing, only a breathing through the sense organs, not through the lungs, is sense perception. Beginning then to be more remote from lung breathing and having for its support the thinking organisms is the forming of mental conceptions, thinking as such. And already bordering on the other side upon the rhythm of the blood circulation, beginning to be an inward breathing that combines with the metabolic and limb organisms, is the function which manifests itself in the play of fancy. This extends then, as a sole function, down into the sphere of the will, even as the circulatory rhythm extends into the metabolic and limb organism. In the exercise of fancy, the thinking system approaches quite close to the willing system. It is a dipping down of the man into his waking sleep sphere of will. Accordingly, with men whose organisation is of this kind, the contents of their soul world appear like waking dreams. In Gotha there lived a human organisation of this kind. That is why he says that Schiller must interpret his poetic dreams for him. In Schiller himself the other kind of organisation was active. He lived on the strength of what he brought with him from his previous earth lives. To a strenuous will he was obliged to seek the fancy that should give it content. People whose disposition lies more towards the region of fancy, so that with them all conceptions of sense reality turn of themselves, so to speak, into pictures of fancy, are the ones on whom the aromatic powers reckon in their world plans. They think that with the assistance of people of this kind they will be able completely to cut off the evolution of mankind from its path and bring it into the direction they are wanting. People whose organisation tends more towards the region of the will but who, out of inner love for an idealistic world conception, vigorously convert their sense conceptions into forms of fancy, are the ones on whom the luciferic powers reckon. By means of such human beings, the luciferic powers hope to maintain man's evolution altogether within the impulses of the path. They could then keep man from going down into the sphere where the aromatic powers have to be conquered. In their earthly life, men are placed between two polar opposites. Overhead, far and wide, spread the stars. Thence reign the forces which have to do with all that is regular and calculable in earth life regular alternation of day and night, seasons of the year, world periods of lengthier duration. All this is the earthly reflection of processes originating amid the stars. The opposite pole radiates from the inside of the earth. The irregular has here its life. Wind and weather, thunder and lightning, earthquakes, volcanic outbursts, reflect these inner earth events. Man is an image of this star on earth life. In his thinking system lives the order of the stars. In his limb and will system lives earth chaos. In the rhythmic system, man's own earthly being is realised in the free balance of the two. Leading thoughts. Man has received his spiritual and bodily organisation from two sides. First in organisation from the physical and etheric cosmos. All that is radiating of divine spiritual being into this organisation in the human being lives in him as the power of sense perception, the faculty of memory and the play of fancy. Secondly, man received his organisation from his preceding earth lives. This organisation is entirely one of soul and spirit and lives in man through the astral body and the eye. The life of divine spiritual beings which here finds its way into man's being works on and lights up in man as the voice of conscience and the light. In his rhythmic organisation, man is forever combining the divine spiritual impulses from both sides. In the inner living realisation of this rhythm, the power of memory is carried into the life of will, 
and the force of conscience into the life of ideas. The Michael Mystery, Chapter 27 The Apparent Extinction of the Knowledge of the Spirit in the New Age Whoever would form a just estimate of anthroposophy and the relation it bears to the evolution of the spiritual soul must look ever and again at the particular constitution of mind among civilised humanity, which began with the rise of the natural sciences and reached its culmination in the 19th century. Let him but place the peculiar character of this age before his soul's eye and compare it with that of earlier ages. At all times during mankind's conscious evolution, knowledge was regarded as being that which brings man together with the world of spirit. Whatever a man was in relation to the spirit that he ascribed to knowledge, in art as in religion, knowledge lived. A change came with the first dawning gleams of the age of consciousness. Knowledge now began no more to concern itself with a great part of human soul life. It was bent upon investigating the kind of relation which man develops towards external existence when he directs his senses and his reasoning mind onto the world of nature. But it refused any longer to concern itself with the relations which man develops towards the spirit world when he makes the same use of his inner faculties of perception as he does of his outer senses. Thus it came about of necessity that the spiritual life of man became linked not with the known of the present age, but with the knowledge of past ages, with tradition. A split came into man's soul life, it fell into two. Before him was nature knowledge on the one side, striving ever further and further afield, unfolding its powers in actual and living presence. On the other side was the inner life, with its being an experience of a relation to the spirit world at once, in olden times, and been fed from a corresponding fount of knowledge. From this being experience there gradually faded away all understanding as to how, in olden times, this corresponding knowledge had come about. Men possessed the tradition, but no longer the way by which the truths handed down by tradition had been known. They could only believe in the tradition. Anyone who considered the spiritual situation with a perfectly calm and luminous mind about the middle of the 19th century could not but have said to himself, Humanity has reached a point when the only knowledge which it it still thinks itself capable of developing has nothing to do with the spirit. Whatever it is possible to know about the spirit, mankind in former times was able to discover today the capacity for such discovery has gone from the human soul. In all its force and bearings, however, people did not place the situation thus clearly before the mind's eye. They confined themselves to saying, Knowledge simply does not reach to the spiritual world. The spiritual world can only be an object of faith. It may shed some light on the matter if we look back into the times when Grecan wisdom was forced to yield place to the Christianized Roman world. When the last schools of Greek philosophy were closed by the Roman emperor, the last treasures too of ancient spiritual learning wandered away from the soul on which henceforth the European spirit developed its life and thought. They found connection with the Academy of Gondi Chapur in Asia, This was one of the places where, owing to the deeds of Alexander, the tradition of the ancient learning had remained preserved in the East. In the form which Aristotle had been able to give it, this ancient learning was still living there. It was caught, however, in the tide of the eastern stream which one may name Arabism. Arabism is, in one aspect of its character, a premature development of the spiritual soul. Through a soul life working prematurely in the direction of the spiritual soul, Arabism afforded the opportunity for a spiritual wave to pour itself from Asia through this channel over Africa, Southern Europe, Western Europe, and so to fill certain members of a European humanity with an intellectualism which ought only to have come later. Southern and Western Europe received in the 7th and 8th centuries 
spiritual impulses which should really not have come until the age of the spiritual soul. This spiritual wave could awaken the intellectual life in man, but not that deeper level of experience by which the soul enters into the spiritual world. And so, when man was exercising his faculties of knowledge in the 15th to 19th centuries, he could only go down to a depth of soul not deep enough for him to light upon the spiritual world. The Arabism by which a European spiritual life was invaded kept human souls and their life of knowledge back from the spiritual world. Prematurely it brought into action that intellect which can only take hold of external nature. And this Arabism proved very powerful. Upon whomsoever it laid its grasp, an inward and for the most part all unconscious arrogance began to take hold of this person's soul. He felt the power of intellectualism, but did not feel the inability of the mere intellect to penetrate into reality. So he abandoned himself to that external reality which comes of its own accord to men and works upon their senses. He never thought of taking any step towards the spiritual reality. This was the situation with which the spiritual life of the Middle Ages was faced. It had inherited the mighty traditions of the spirit world but all its soul life was so steeped in intellectualism through, one might say, the covert influence of Arabism, that knowledge found no access to the sources whence the inherited traditions, after all, drew their substance. Thenceforth, from the early Middle Ages on, there was a constant struggle between what was instinctively felt in men's minds as a link with the spirit and the form which thought had assumed under Arabism. Men felt within them the world of ideas. To their inner life it was an immediate reality, but they could not find in their souls the power to experience, within the ideas, the living spirit. Thus arose the realist philosophy, which felt a reality in the ideas, but could not find this reality. This realist philosophy heard in the ideal world the speech of the cosmic word, but was not able to understand its language. The nominalist philosophy, on the other hand, contended that since the speech was not understandable, it was not there at all. For nominalism, the world of ideas was only a collection of formulae in the human soul, without root in any spiritual reality. What was here surging in these two opposing currents lived on into the 19th century. Nominalism became the scientific school of thought, for the knowledge of the natural world. From external data of the sense world it built up a grand conceptual structure, but it reduced to nothing all insight into the inner being of the world of ideas. Realism lived a dead existence. It knew of the reality of the world of ideas, but could not attain to it in living and perceptive knowledge. Men will, however, attain to it when anthroposophy finds the way to a living experience of the spirit in the ideas. Side by side with the nominalism of the natural sciences must stand a realism, truly advanced and developed, bringing a way of knowledge which shows that the knowledge of spiritual things has not died out of mankind, but can rise anew from new open sources in the human soul and flow once more through human evolution. Leading thought. Anyone who turns the eyes of his soul upon the course of human evolution in the age of natural science is met at first sight by a gloomy prospect. Splendid is the growth of man's knowledge in respect to all things of the external world, but there comes over him in return a peculiar form of consciousness, as though a knowledge of the spiritual world had ceased to be possible at all. It seems as though such knowledge could only have been possessed by men in olden times, and as though with regard to the spiritual world, people must simply remain content to accept the old traditions and make them an object of belief. From the resulting uncertainty during the Middle Ages concerning man's relation to the spiritual world, there arose on the one hand a disbelief in the real spirit content of ideas, represented by nominalism, of which the modern scientific view of nature is a continuation, and on the other hand as a knowledge of the reality of ideas, realism, which however can only find its fulfilment 
in anthroposophy. The Michael Mystery, Chapter 28 Historic Upheavals at the Dawn of the Spiritual Soul The downfall of the Roman Empire, accompanied by the appearance on the scene of peoples moving on from the east, the so-called migration of the peoples, is a historic phenomenon on which the eyes of man must be turned again and again in inquiry. For the present time still contains much that is after effect of those tremendous occurrences. But it is just here that an understanding of what happened is not possible for a mere external study of history. One must look into the souls of the human beings engaged in this migration and in the downfall of the Roman Empire. Greece and Rome were at the flower of their civilization during the period when in mankind at large the intellectual or mind soul is developing. The Greeks and Romans are indeed the more special bearers of this development, for the evolution of this stage of the soul amongst these peoples is not such as to have in it a living seed which could probably evolve out of itself the spiritual soul. Every treasure of the soul and spirit latent in the intellectual or mind soul is brought in living profusion to the light of day in the civilization of the Greeks and Romans. But to carry its life stream by its own innate power over into the spiritual soul, that it cannot do. The stage of the spiritual soul naturally emerges in due course. Only it is as though this spiritual soul were not able to arise spontaneously out of the personality of the Greek or Roman, but rather as though it had to be implanted in him from without. The state of union with, and again of detachment from, the divine spiritual being, so often spoken of in these letters, takes place in the course of the ages with varying intensity. In old days it was a power that intervened with very forceful effect in the evolution of human affairs. As it enters into the Greek and Roman life of the first centuries of Christianity, the power is a weaker one. Nevertheless it is there. So long as he was developing to the full, the intellectual or mind soul within him, the Greek or Roman experience, not consciously but with important effects for the soul, a feeling of detachment from the divine spiritual form of being, an emancipation of his own human being. This came to an end in the first centuries of Christianity, the first glimmering dawn of the spiritual soul, because the spiritual soul itself was not yet able to be received into the human being. And so they felt this Christian content as something that came ready given to them from without, from the spiritual outer world, not as something with which they grew together and became identified through their own inherent powers of knowledge. It was otherwise with the peoples now coming into history out of the North East. They had passed through the stage of the intellectual or mind soul in a condition which, in their case, was felt as one of dependence on the spirit world. They first began to feel something of human independence when the nascent powers of the spiritual soul dawned in their first Christian beginning. Amongst these people, the spiritual soul made its appearance as something closely bound up with the very being of man. They felt themselves in the full joyous expansion of inward power when the spiritual soul was awakening to life within them. Into the first fresh life of the dawning spiritual soul amongst these people fell the inner content of Christianity. They felt it as something coming to life within their souls, not as something ready given from without. Such was the tone of mind in which these people came to the Roman Empire and all that this involved. Such was the Arian mood as contrasted with the Athanasian. A profound contrast was here emerging in human history and evolution. In the spiritual soul of the Greek and Roman, external to the man himself, the divine being began its work, not completely uniting with the earthly life, but only reign in upon it. In the just dawning spiritual soul of the Franks, the Germanic tribes, etc., there was at work, but as yet faintly, 
so much of divine spirit as was able to unite itself with the human being. What happened next was that the former Christian content which dwelt in the spiritual soul hovering over and outside of man spread abroad in life, whilst that which was united with men's souls remained something that abode in the inner mind as an incentive, an impulse biding the time of its full development, which can only come with the attainment of a certain stage in the spiritual soul's evolution. The period from the first centuries of Christianity down to the age of the spiritual soul is a time when the dominant spiritual life of mankind is one which hovers above man. It is a spiritual content with which he cannot connect himself knowingly through the exercise of his own powers of man. Accordingly, he establishes an external connection. He explains this spiritual content and examines in thought the precise limits where the soul's power falls short of uniting with it in clear knowledge. He draws a boundary line between the province over which his knowledge reaches and that where it does not reach. The result is a deliberate abstention from the employment of those soul powers which rise with knowledge into the world of spirit. And so at last there comes a time, at the turn of the 17th and 19th centuries, when, with the very powers that should be directed to spiritual realities, men repudiate all spiritual reality and turn away from the spirit with their life of knowledge altogether. They begin to live in those soul powers only, which are directed to things perceptible by the outer senses. Dull grow men's powers of knowledge, blunted to spiritual things, in the 18th century more especially. The thinkers lose the spiritual content of their ideas. In the idealist philosophy of the first half of the 19th century, they represent the spirit void ideas themselves as the creative reality and content of the world, thus fish. Schelling, Hegel, or else they refer to a supersensible which fades away because the spirit is not in it, thus Spencer, John Stuart Mill and others. Ideas are dead when they do not seek the living spirit. The spiritual eye for the spiritual is, in fact, lost. A continuation of the old way of spirit knowledge is not possible. The soul's powers, as the spiritual soul develops in them, must strive through to their own newly generated union, living and direct with the spirit world. This very striving is the essence and intention of anthroposophy. In the spiritual life of the present age, it is precisely the leading people who are most at a loss to know the meaning of anthroposophy, or what its object is. And in this way, large circles who follow these leaders are also kept aloof. The leaders live amid a content of soul and mind which has gradually lost the habit of using man's spiritual powers. With these people, it is as, as though one were to try and induce a man who is paralysed to make use of his paralysed organ. For it was paralysis that set in during the time from the 16th century to the second half of the 19th paralysis of the higher powers of knowledge, and men remained all conscious of it. They regarded the one-sided application of their powers of knowledge to the sense world as an important step in human progress. Leading Thoughts The Greeks and Romans are the people specially predisposed for the evolution of the intellectual or mind-soul. They developed this stage of the soul to full completion but they have not the living seed within themselves through which to pass on in direct line to the spiritual soul. Their soul life is completely merged into the intellectual or mind soul. What comes instead during the time from the rise of Christianity to the age of evolving the spiritual soul is the reign above of a spirit world which does not unite with the human soul powers. These soul powers explain the spirit world who do not experience it. The peoples moving down upon the Roman Empire from the northeast in the so called migration of the peoples take hold of the intellectual or mind soul more in the life of feeling. Meanwhile, embedded in this feeling element 
the spiritual soul is developing its powers in their souls. The inner life of these peoples is waiting for the time when a complete union of the human soul with the spiritual world will once more be possible. The Michael Mystery Chapter 29 From Nature to Subnature People talk of the philosophic age having been superseded about the middle of the 19th century and having given place to the age of natural science. They talk too as though the age of natural science was still in continuance at the present day, although many at the same time lay stress on the return to certain philosophic tendencies of thought. This is all quite correct as regards the direction taken by the new age in its lines of knowledge, but not in its lines of life. With his mental imagery man is still living in nature, even though he brings a mechanicistic way of thinking into his understanding of nature. But with the life of his will, he is living in a machinery of technical processes to such an extent that this has long given an entirely new colouring to the age of natural science. If one would understand human life, there are two sides from which one must begin by regarding it. From his previous earth lives, man brings with him the faculty of forming mental conceptions of the cosmic influences that act from out of the earth's environment and of those which are at work within the sphere of the earth itself. Through his senses he perceives the cosmic element that is at work within the earthly realm through his thinking organism. He thinks the cosmic that acts upon the earth and the surrounding universe. Thus he lives through his physical body a life of perception and through his ether body a life of thought. What goes on in the astral body and in the eye is at work in more covert regions of the soul. It is at work, for instance, in a man's destiny or fate. One must not, however, look for it, to begin with, in the intricate complexities of human destiny, but rather in the simple elementary processes of life. Man unites himself with definite earth forces by the fact of bringing his own body into bearing with the lines of these forces. He learns to stand and walk upright. He learns with his arms and hands to bring himself into poise with the balance of the earthly forces. Now these are not forces of a kind that work from without, from the cosmos. They are merely earthly. In reality, nothing that man experiences in his inner life is an abstraction. He only does not perceive where the experience comes from, and so of his ideas about realities, he makes abstractions. Man talks about the laws of mechanics. He thinks he has deduced them by abstraction from the complex of natural phenomena. This is not, however, the case, but rather everything which a man realises in his soul as a purely mechanical law is learnt from direct inward experience of his own bearings in and towards the earth world, in standing, walking and so on. This, however, marks the mechanical as the purely earthly, for everything which exists in earthly form as laws of nature, in colour, sound and so forth, is a gift from out of the cosmos. Only within this sphere of earth does all this realm of nature acquire, engrafted into it, the mechanical element, even as man meets with this element in his own life and experience only within the earth sphere. By far the greater part of all that is at work through the agency of technical science and the civilization of today is not nature, but sub-nature. It is a world which is emancipating itself from nature downward. Observe how the Oriental, when in pursuit of the spirit, seeks to disengage himself from those states of equilibrium which are due solely to the earth. He adopts for meditation a posture which brings him solely into the cosmic equilibrium. The earth is then no longer exerting an influence upon the disposition of his whole organism. This is not put forward for imitation, but only to make what was said more plain. Those who are acquainted with my writings know how the spiritual life of East and West differ in his respect. Man needed this relation with the merely earthly for the evolution of his spiritual soul. But in more recent times there came the tendency, everywhere, in his own doings as well, to give practical effort to this element with which, as man, 
he must needs make himself familiar. And as he penetrates into this merely earthly realm, he encounters the world of Araman. He must learn to bring himself and his own human being into right relation with this Aramanic element. As yet, in the course hitherto taken by the technical age, he has not found the way to readjust his human relation rightly to this new civilization of Ariman. Man must find the strength, the inner faculty of knowledge and discernment, for his human being not to be overwhelmed by Ariman in the civilization of technics. Subnature must be understood in this, its character of under-nature. It will only be so understood if man rises at least as high in spiritual knowledge of that supernature which lies outside the earthly sphere as he has descended in technical science below it into subnature. The age needs a power of knowledge that rises above nature because it has inwardly to deal with an element which is dangerously at work within its life and which is one that has sunk below nature. Of course, what is here meant is not any sort of return to earlier states of civilization, but rather that man should find his way to bring the new conditions of civilization to right relation with himself and with the cosmos. As yet, there are but few who have any feeling of the important spiritual task which man has here before him. Take, for instance, electricity, how did it discover as the very soul of the natural world Electricity must be recognised in its own peculiar power to lead down from nature to sub-nature. Only man must not glide down with it. In the time when there was as yet no independent realm of technics apart from what might rightly be termed nature, man found the spirit in his contemplation of nature. Technics, becoming detached from nature, reverted man's eyes to the mechanistic and material world as the scientific one whence his knowledge must henceforth be derived. Now in this world, of all the divine spiritual life connected with the first origins of human evolution, nothing remains. The purely aromanic dominates this sphere. But in a science of the spirit, the other sphere is created, from which an aromanic element is altogether absent. It is precisely by taking into his mind that form of spiritual intelligence to which the Aramanic powers have no access that man gains the strength to meet Araman in the world, to encounter him here. Leading Thoughts In the age of natural science, beginning about the middle of the 19th century, there is in human civilization a gradual downslide of the occupations and activity of men not only into the lowest regions of nature, but down below nature. Technical civilization becomes sub-nature. This makes it necessary for man in living in your experience to come to a spirit knowledge in which he rises as high above into supernature as he does down below nature with his subnatural technical occupations. He thereby creates within him the power not to go under. An earlier view of the natural world still contained within it a spirit with which human evolution is bound up in its first sources. Little by little this spirit has vanished from man's picture of nature. The purely aromanic element has taken possession of the picture and has overflowed from thence into the technical civilization of today. The Michael Mystery by Rudolf Steiner The Michael Mystery 